Hello everyone, welcome to Lesson 7.38. I've entitled this video, Ingredients for Good Government. This video is going to cover pages 194 to 197. The Constitution's Sources Although an American document, the Constitution has roots in other civilizations. The delegates who wrote the document studied the history of political thought in an effort to avoid the mistakes of the past. Many ideas found in the Constitution came from European political institutions and writers. The framers who shaped the document were familiar with the parliamentary system of Britain. Many had taken part in their colonial or state assemblies. They valued the individual rights guaranteed by the British judicial system. Although the Americans broke away from British rule, they respected many British traditions or cultural beliefs and practices. Question number one. Why did the Constitutional Convention delegates study the history of political thoughts? Well, they believed that they could avoid the mistakes of the past by studying what those mistakes were. That is much of why we teach history today. Question two, where did many of the ideas found in the Constitution come from? It came from European political institutions and European writers. Question three, even though we broke away from Britain, how did they influence our Constitution? While many of our founding fathers still valued those individual rights guaranteed in the British judicial system, and we still used many of the same traditions that Britain had passed down. European influences. The English Magna Carta in 1215 placed limits on the power of the monarch. Parliament, England's lawmaking body, became a force that the king or queen had to depend on to pay for wars and the royal government. Like Parliament, colonial assemblies controlled their colonies' funds. The assemblies had some control over colonial governors. Question number four. How did the Magna Carta influence our Constitution? Well, it placed limits on what the leader or monarch at that time could do. And that is a tradition that has been since, and that if you think about it, that's over 800 plus years ago, that the concept that the executive or the leader could have limits on their power was something that England really started with that Magna Carta. The English Bill of Rights of 1689 was another model for Americans. In fact, many people in the United States felt the Constitution also needed a Bill of Rights. The framers believed in the ideas about the nature of people and government put forth by European writers of the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment was a movement of the 1700s that promoted knowledge, reason, and science as a means of improving society. James Madison and other framers of the Constitution were familiar with the work of John Locke, pictured on the left, and Baron de Montesquieu, pictured on the right, two philosophers of the Enlightenment. Question number five. How did the English Bill of Rights of 1689 influence the Constitution? Well, they were another example for us to follow in the concept that people deserve to have their basic rights protected by the government. And many people asked for those to be included in the original Constitution. And while they weren't originally in the Constitution, they will be added very quickly afterwards in what are called the ten, first 10 amendments known as the Bill of Rights. Question six, what was the Enlightenment? The Enlightenment was a time period, a movement of the 1700s. And in that, instead of thinking about like superstitions and things that you can't prove, the Age of Enlightenment promoted knowledge, reason, and science as a way to making everyone's lives better. The English philosopher Locke wrote that all people have natural rights. He stated that these natural rights included the rights of life, liberty, and property. In his two treatises of civil government, 1690, he wrote that government is based on an agreement or contract between the people and the ruler. Americans interpreted natural rights to mean the rights of Britons defined in the Magna Carta and the English Bill of Rights. The framers viewed the Constitution as a contract between the American people and their government. The contract protected people's natural rights by limiting government power. Question seven. In the, excuse me, the English thinker John Locke wrote that all people have three natural rights. What did he say were those three natural rights? Life, liberty, and property. And of course, we know that Thomas Jefferson sort of amended those, made them better, and said pursuit of happiness instead of property. 
Question 8. What did John Locke say that government should be? He said that government should be a contract or agreement between the people and the ruler. Question number 9. How did the framers view the Constitution? They saw it just like that. A contract between the American people and the government. The French writer Montesquieu declared in The Spirit of Laws, 1748, that the powers of government should be separated and balanced against each other. This separation, or separation of powers as it's come to be called, would prevent any one person or group from gaining too much power. The framers of the Constitution carefully spelled out and divided the powers of government. Question number 10. What did the French thinker Baron de Montesquieu say about the powers of the government? that those powers should be separated and they should be balanced against one another. Federalism. The Constitution created a federal system of government that divided powers between the national or federal government and the states. And you can see a Venn diagram over here that shows as much to the right. In the Articles of Confederation, the states held most powers. Under the Constitution, the states gave up some powers to the federal government and kept others. Federalism, or sharing power between the federal and state governments, is one of the key features of the United States government. Under the Constitution, the federal government gained wide-ranging powers to tax, regulate trade, control the currency, raise an army, and declare war. It could also pass laws that were, quote, necessary and proper for carrying out its responsibilities. That necessary and proper clause is called the Elastic Clause. This power would allow Congress to make laws as needed to deal with new situations. The Constitution left some important powers to the states. The states kept the power to control trade inside their borders. They also could set up local governments and schools and establish marriage and divorce laws. The Constitution also called for the sharing of some powers between the federal and state governments. Both federal and state governments would have the power to tax and to establish criminal justice, for example. And if you look at the Venn diagram here in the right side, you can see here are the powers that the national or federal government can do. Here are some powers that the states can do. And then you've got some shared powers, and that's a key part of federalism. And these are things that both the federal and state governments can do and share those powers together. And that leads us to question number 11. What does the word federalism mean? Federalism is the sharing of power between the federal and state governments. Question 12. What were five powers given to Congress under the new Constitution? They could tax, regulate trade, control the currency, raise an army, declare war. Question 13. What is the Elastic Clause and why is it an important power of Congress? The Elastic Clause gives Congress the power to pass laws that they believe are, quote, necessary and proper. Now that is a very vague statement and they did that on purpose and the reason for that is it allows Congress to deal with the changing times. When the Founding Fathers made the Constitution, there were no such things as cars, computers, the internet, space shuttle, nuclear weapons, the list goes on and on. But by having a clause called the Elastic Clause that says Congress can make powers that are necessary and proper, it has allowed them to make laws according to our Constitution to deal with those changing times. Question number, let's see, where are we at? We're on 14. What were some powers left to the states under the Constitution? Well, under the Constitution, some of the powers that were left to the states included setting up local governments, setting up schools, and establishing marriage and divorce laws. Question number 15. What are two examples of powers that are shared between the federal and state governments? And those would be things such as taxing, because you know someone like me, I pay both a federal tax to the Washington, D.C. government, and I also pay a state tax to the state of Illinois. So taxing is one, and establishing criminal justice is another. There are state prisons, and there are federal prisons. To so just name a couple. Government structure. The framers of the Constitution used Montesquieu's idea of a separation of powers. They divided the federal government into three branches, legislative, executive, and judicial. The first three articles or parts of the Constitution describe each branch's powers and responsibilities. 
They detail the methods for electing or selecting key members of each branch. Question number 16. The framers of the Constitution used separation of powers to divide the power into three branches. What are the three branches called? Legislative, executive, and judicial. Government branches. Article 1 of the Constitution declares Congress to be the legislative branch, or lawmaking branch, of the government. Congress is made up of the House of Representatives and the Senate. The powers of Congress include establishing taxes, coining money, and regulating trade. Question number 17. Article 1 deals with the legislative branch. What is another name for the legislative branch? Congress. Question 18. What does the legislative branch do? They are the branch that makes the laws. Question number 19. What are the two houses of the legislative branch or Congress called? They're called the House of Representatives, which is the lower house, and the upper house is called the Senate. And that's due to the Great Compromise by Roger Sherman. Article 2 of the Constitution sets up the executive branch to carry out the nation's laws and policies. At the head of this branch are the president and vice president. A special group called the Electoral College elects the president and vice president. Voters in each state choose the electors who make up the Electoral College. Question number 20. Article 2 of the Constitution deals with the executive branch. What does the executive branch do? The executive branch carries out the nation's laws and policies. Question 21. Who are the two people in charge of the executive branch? They are the president and the vice president. Question 22. What special group elects the president and vice president every four years? That would be the electoral college. Article 3 deals with the judicial branch or court system. The nation's judicial power resides in one Supreme Court and any lower federal courts Congress creates. The Supreme Court and other federal courts hear cases involving the Constitution, federal laws, and disputes between states. Question 23. Article 3 of the Constitution deals with the judicial branch. What does the judicial branch do? They are the court system. They judge or interpret the fairness of laws to make sure that the laws are being followed, and if broken, they deal out the consequences. 24. What is the highest court in America called? That is called the Supreme Court. And here we see a picture of our current nine Supreme Court justices. If this video is newly released, which it is this year, but in future years, those Supreme Court justices might be changing, just depending on a variety of factors. And here we see the separation of powers laid out. We have the legislative branch, once again, that makes laws, the executive branch that decides or excuse me, that enforces or executes those laws. And then you have the judicial branch that judges the laws and decides if they are being implemented fairly. Checks and balances. The Constitution contains a system of checks and balances. This means each branch of government has ways to check or limit the power of the other branches. With this system, no single branch can gain too much power in the government. You will learn more about this system in another chapter, but the best way I like to describe it is the concept of rock, paper, scissors. In rock, paper, scissors, each of the three is better than one and not as good as the other, so in a way, they are watching over each other. That's what makes that game fun. If rock always won, then no one would ever pick scissors or paper. So our system of checks and balances is used in much similar ways in our system of government, each branch is watching the other branch to make sure it doesn't get too powerful. And that is the answer to 25. How is the system of checks and balances used in our constitution? Each branch is watching the other one to make sure it doesn't get too powerful. Well, thank you for watching. Before we go, of course, I have a meme and I've got two for you today. Let's make a government based on rock, paper, scissors. And if mom says no, you ask dad. It's called the checks and balances system. <laughs> I wouldn't try that at home, kids, but that's up to you. Thank you so much for watching, and have a great day.